are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you are Lord of all, no beginning and no end, you're my hope and my defense, you came to seek and save the lost, you paid it all upon the Can a prostitute really be an example of faith? See Hebrews 11.31. Rahab's story is told in the book of Joshua, especially chapters 2 and 6. And she makes a special guest appearance in the genealogy of Christ in Matthew's first chapter. Kirk Brothers is the president of Heritage Christian University. In this lesson, he helps us think about what it means to repent and turn toward God. When the tsunami hit Japan and the Japanese coast in 2011, when that tsunami hit the Japanese coast, it was particularly hard on one coastal town. This particular town lost 80% of their homes. One third of the citizens were washed away. There had been a 70,000 red and black pine tree forest that had been planted many years before as protection from wind and sea to protect the town. In the aftermath of that tsunami, of the original 70,000 trees that once stood there, one single 90-foot, 200-year-old pine tree remained. For the people of that small community in Japan, that pine tree became a symbol of hope. So much so that even a year and a half later when that tree died because of the, the salt content that had already come into the roots and the trunk and the damage from the tsunami, that they erected an exact replica of that tree to remind them that they can still stand and to give them a message of hope. Today we talk about the rehab of Rahab and the wall that did not fall. If we look in Matthew, we'll find in the genealogy of Jesus an unusual thing we find a woman, a Canaanite, from a pagan idol-worshiping people. In Joshua chapter 6, when they marched around the city on the seventh day and shouted, the walls came down, the army invaded the city, all were to be destroyed, but they showed favoritism to one woman and one family. Why? Why? Why in the world do we have someone in the genealogy of Jesus who is a prostitute? Why is it of all the people in the city of Jericho, why was she shown favoritism? For many years, the survivor shows were all the rage. You had Survivor Man... You had man versus wild. There was a man, woman, wild, a dual survival. You can go on and on. The reason I mention that, because really the story in Joshua 2 and Joshua 6 is a story of survivors. You have some survivor men in the story. You may remember back in Genesis chapter 12, God made three promises to Abraham, and those three promises are the outline of the Bible. One of those promises is that his descendants would have their own land. So the book of Joshua tells the story about that promise being fulfilled. Of how they prepared to come in the land, how they took possession of the land, how they portioned it out among the various tribes, and then how he called them to make a decision. Will you praise the gods of the land or will you praise 
the one true God who gave you the land and said, as for me and my house, we've made our decision. We will serve the Lord. We get to Joshua chapter 1, they're about to go in and take possession of the land. And so Joshua sends out two spies. It's interesting he chose two. You remember 40 years before, Moses sent 12 and only two gave a favorable report. I cannot but wonder, since Joshua was one of those two spies, that maybe it wasn't just military advantage that caused him to send two. Maybe he's sending a message to the people. Only two believed. And maybe then I'll only send two spies. They enter just above the Dead Sea. And so the first city they're going to encounter is Jericho. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the remains of Jericho. And they've unearthed a great deal. So we can learn something about Jericho. Part of the difficulty is dating some of the walls and the foundations that they have found. But they believe, based on what they have found there, that you had two walls around Jericho that you had a 12-foot wall and you had a 6-foot wall and there was a, about a 15-foot sloping embankment in between them. This would be a significant, though not massive city compared to some other cities of the day. It would have been a significant task to take this city without a long, long siege by the Israelites. The text tells us that the spies hid under flax Flax was largely imported into this region from Egypt. It was not generally native to the region of Judea. The flax plant was useful for clothing and it was useful for ropes. The young tender plants, they would use those fibers to make clothing. They would then, with the older and tougher plants, they would use those fibers to make rope. And they had this process they would take it through where they would soak the plants in stagnant water and then they would dry them and then they would soak them and they would dry them and as they did that process they would work the the fibers in their hands to separate them out going back and forth wetting and drying and wetting and drying one scholar for example said that lying under a pile of wet flax would be something like hiding under pig slop it would have been an awful awful smell the text also tells us that they hid in the wilderness for three days. Now I want us to remember that this is a dry and barren region. This is a desert region. It would have been a difficult place to live and a difficult place to survive. Joshua chapter 12 also tells us that when they returned back to Joshua, they said basically the people are already defeated. Their hearts have melted. God will give us the victory. So these men survive because they're smart, they're strong, and they believe that God would give them success. But this is really not a story about survivor men, but about a survivor woman. She's a pragmatic woman. She does what it takes to survive. She does what it takes to make a living. And when she's deciding the God she's going to follow, she does it based on what she sees that God doing. She's a pragmatist. As we look at the text, the text tells us that Rahab's home was in a house along the wall of the city. The ruins of ancient Jericho give evidence of homes that were up against the plastered side of the outer wall of the city of Jericho. The advantage to the homeowner is it reinforces and gives strength to one side of the house. The advantage to the city to have homes up against the wall and that space between the two walls is that it gives reinforcement to the outer wall of the city. The text not only tells us about her home and where it was, the text tells us that she was a prostitute, a harlot. Now when we read Josephus and other early Jewish writers, they referred to her as an innkeeper. You've got to remember, she shows up in the genealogy of their kings. So they're probably going to want to sanitize what is known about her. And the reality is when we compare what the Bible says and attributes to her that she was a prostitute with the statement by Josephus and others that she was an innkeeper, the reality is they may both be right. 
that she was an innkeeper, but it was a house with benefits, if you will. And what's interesting is, potentially, if she is a prostitute, has a home of prostitution, that's not necessarily a bad place to gather information. Because if there's anything like today, and we always have to understand when you're dealing with the past, none of us live there, there's no videos, there are no audio recordings, so to some degree it's guesswork. But we could see how her home would be a place of secrecy. In other words, when you go there, you don't ask questions, you don't give information, you don't want anybody to know you are there, and you're not going to tell people what you saw or who you saw there because you're afraid somebody's going to have seen you there, and then you're going to have to also explain why you were there to see what you saw. So it's not a bad place to gather information. Though, before we go in that direction, there's something else that's worth thinking about. It's interesting that the text says that when the king sent his messengers to get the spies, I find it puzzling that they didn't barge into the home. Remember, these are spies, enemy spies from an invading army. They know they're about to be invaded. Yet there's no evidence in the text that they broke down her door and charged into the home. And I understand there are various reasons for why they might have done that. It's just puzzling to me when the city's under siege, if they think there's any chance this woman is guilty of treason or harboring spies, or even in, if she's not harboring spies, I find it puzzling that the king would really be concerned about her life, that somehow that would prevent him from just barging into the home. It's almost like from the outside, the messengers of the king say, hey, would you send them out? There's, there's a deference there that's a little bit puzzling to me. Some scholars have posited that she might have been a temple prostitute. We do know in the Greek culture, but not just in the Greek culture, other cultures prior to that, that sexual relationships, prostitution, were a part of worship to various gods and goddesses of the ancient world. If, in fact, that's what she was, then she would be functioning somewhat as a priestess, and we could understand why there would be a deference to her on the behalf of the king. At the end of the day, that's total guesswork and we don't know. All we know is that the king somehow learned that the spies were in her home and wanted her to send them out. We also know from the text that she lied. She lied about the spies and where they were. She lied about her interaction with them and what she did. She gave them false information and sent them away. And a lot of times folks will, will struggle with this. How do we have someone listed in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11 as, uh, or someone listed in James 2 as an example of faith in action. How do we have someone in the genealogy of, of Jesus that's so prominent and listed as a hero lying? I think there's a couple of things that we need to remember. I think the first thing that we need to remember is this is a woman with a very basic faith. Okay, she has come to believe that the God of Israel is alive and powerful, but that's about it. She knows nothing of the law of Moses. She knows nothing of the morality of the God of Israel. She just, based on what she's seen, thinks he's powerful. And so to conclude from the fact she believes in God, that she understands biblical morality, is, is a leap that's unfair to her to take. But it's interesting in the story that the spies, the representatives of Joshua, key men in Israel, want her to continue the lie. So that then goes beyond the fact that she has an immature faith. The men who should have had a mature faith wanted her to lie. And we need to remember, this is in warfare. This is a, these are military spies who've been sent in to spy the land that they are about to invade because God said so. Remember, Moses had sent in spies. The concept of a spy is deception. A spy doesn't learn anything by saying, I am a spy for your enemy for your future invaders, please tell me all your information. They function based on deception. And regularly, often at the command of God in the story of Israel, in battle they practice deception. They practice deception when they took the city of Ai with one invading army and others in hiding. They didn't announce, let me tell you where all my armies are. They practice deception. So deception is a part of what goes on in warfare. To extrapolate from that, that because they practice deception in battle, that suddenly it's okay for me to lie to my wife or to the elders or to cheat on a test or not pay my taxes is a totally different situation and inappropriate. 
context is very, very important. As we continue to look at the text, I want us to say, think about some things here. Remember, she has an immature faith. I also want us to remember that she's not the only one who has faith. She says, the text tells us, that the reason she had faith is because she had heard about what God had done for Israel in delivering them from Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and defeating two kings already before they even came into the land. But she not only said that she believed in God because of that, the people of her city did. It's really important in the story of Rahab to remember she wasn't the only believer in the city. If you'd gone up and down from house to house and asked them, do you believe the God of Israel is real? In house after house, they would have said yes. If you would have asked in house after house, do you believe the God of Israel is powerful and He can take this city? They would have said yes, based on the report they had heard. She wasn't the only one that believed that God exists and that He's powerful. But she's the only one in the city who trusted and obeyed. She was the only one who acted on her faith. She was the only one willing to risk everything. And that is why she's listed in James chapter 2 as an example of faith in action. Because real faith is always put into action. Saving faith is not just faith in the head or the heart, but it's faith that is lived out in life. She asked the spies to take care of her family. And they promised to do so. She snuck them out of her home. And she told them where to hide and how long to stay there. They told her that she needed to make sure that she and her family members were in her home. And that their grace, if you will, extended only to the house that she lived in. That she was to put a cord in the window as a sign to the invading armies of which home was hers. Rahab was a woman with faults. She was from a pagan, idol-worshiping culture with a sinful lifestyle. But she had simple faith in the God that she had heard about, believed that He was real and believed that He was powerful. She was also a woman who desperately loved her family. Now as you think about Rahab's story, the text tells us that the men left the city and that later they are going to invade. When they invaded... On that seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And they blew the trumpets and they shouted and the walls of the city came tumbling down. And when the walls of the city came tumbling down, what's powerful and what's important in the text is that there was one spot in the wall where it did not fall. There was one home that was still standing. When Hurricane Ike hit the Texas coast in 2008, the community of Gilchrist was hit hard. In one patch along the ocean, there were 200 wealthy homes, and that whole section was wiped out except for the Adams house. There was one house that was still standing when that storm raged through. As you think about what happened there, I want you to think about how Rahab becomes a great hero of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to picture the scene. The double walls of this city have crumbled to the ground. There are the shouts of battle and the screams of terror. Smoke from the rubble has risen up and it would have been stifling at first. But gradually the smoke, the dust is going to dissipate. And as it does so, you're going to see one chunk of wall and one single house. A house with a scarlet cord hanging out of the window. When she hung that thread, she was making a life-changing decision to identify with the people of God and the God of the people. She was willing to leave her culture and her king for a God she barely knew. 
and for a people of whom she only knew two. The one who survived was the one who was willing to trust and obey and the one who was in the right place where God told her to be. And because of that, her wall was the wall that did not fall. What about our faith? What about our families? When the battles of life come upon us, will our family still be standing? Will my faith still be standing? Because I trusted, I obeyed, and I was in the right place. I was in Jesus Christ, His church, His assembly, His people. Let's be like Rahab with lives that are like the wall that does not fall. Thank you. No beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all. stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken.